comes on, thanks for coming along. Um, hopefully you get something out of tonight. So tonight we've got Tony Morris talking. Um, Tony will be taking us through some cool stuff. It should be good. Um, if anyone else wants to pipe up and do some more talks or whatever else, has some ideas for formats or anything, that'd be a great idea. Um, I'd like to run a couple of kind of lightning style talks, like maybe two or three talks. Um, in terms of kind of you know me kind of bureaucracy, we thanks to Brad for helping us get the room here. A bit of a struggle, I think, for some of us to get here, but um, especially from the other side of the city. But it's good to have a room, and it's a pretty decent sized room, so that's good. We've got power and stuff, so it's great. And a projector. Um, we're looking at getting a room in the Microsoft uh, offices. Um, they said yes, but then they didn't get back to me. And they said yes again, and they didn't get back to me. So that's why we're here this month. So hopefully next month we'll get a room in the Microsoft building. Um, they've apparently got a lecture theatre that we can go to. And we might even get some extra sharp guys along. Um, but they've got some ideas for talks, and they know some people that can come along too. Some guys from Sydney that travel up and down and things like that. So that should be interesting. Um, I'll let Tony go. Thanks, Tony, for talking to no. That's okay. Alright, hello guys. Some of you I haven't met. Um, I'm Tony Morris. Um, tonight um, I'm going to talk to you about um, a particular topic. Um, I, I basically invented the topic. I had to come up with something that was um, that was not too advanced that I'd lose you guys and something that wasn't too slow that you wouldn't get any, anything out of it. So. Basically, um, I'm going to use the Haskell programming language, as you all probably know, and um, hopefully you've all got that installed in the machine. Um, there's a few guys here that are pretty good with Haskell, so um, hopefully they can help you out as we go through. So I'm, I'm hoping that well, um, we can go through this and you can sort of, um, you know, do the do little things on your laptop as we go and um, sort of learn from it from there. So um, if you haven't already figured it out, I wanted, I, I wanted to talk about automated testing. Um, originally, I was going to talk about monadic parsing, but Tom decided that was a bit too high level for, for an introductory thing, and he convinced me. Um, I think Christian convinced me as well. That was a, so I've, I've sort of got that one lined up for another day, so hopefully we can do that. But um, yeah, we'll talk about automated testing, and um, I was going to ask, have you guys used something like JUnit or NUnit or um, TestNG or anything like that? Is that what you guys use? Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, this is a little bit different um, in terms of testing um, and also using a, a type system, a, a, a good type system like Haskell. So um, you're on. You can. All right. So just before we get started, just make sure everyone's got. Um, everyone's got a um, quick check installed in their, in their GFC implementation. So GFC, by the way, stands for Glasgow Haskell Compiler. It's the de facto standard compiler. Um, there's a few other ones out there. I'll just put on the video tape saying that. I thought someone was going to like saying that. <laughs> and um, yeah, hopefully you don't see that. Okay, so everyone's good there, no one's bad. No? Good. So, um, has has um, anyone used Haskell? Besides the people that I know. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I just saw up to half people, so give me a good idea. So, one of one of the key differences between Haskell and probably languages that we're used that we're used to is that it's it's a pure functional language and it's also lazy by default. So, <clears throat> pure functional means that. Um, uh, when you use the language, each function um, acts only on its given arguments. Okay, so um, in, a, in a function, say, to find the uh, length of a list, you're not free to go off and format the hard disk or run off to read a file or read the network or anything like that. <coughs> and lazy evaluations is the evaluation model we'll call, um, the proper name actually is called by me. Um, basically means, go away basically means that the evaluation occurs outside in. So if you use like Java's um, AND operator, um, Boolean, Boolean AND, so it doesn't evaluate the second argument um, if the first argument is false, for example. So in a pure functional lazy language, that happens on all functions. So it has to be statically typed, and it's a type inferred, so you don't actually specify the types, or you, or you can. So there was a bit of talk on the mailing list about Scala, which is another language that I use a fair bit. 
Um, it, it, it's not it's not pure and it's strict by default, and it's uh, it's it's also got a state type system, and it's somewhat type inferred. Um, I find myself typing types all the time when I use Scala, and it's a somewhat functional programming language. And then all these down here are are impure and strict, so by force, so they don't give you optional laziness. Well, they kind of do when you've got to emulate it a bit. So that's that's the key difference between Haskell and languages that the guys who didn't put their hand up are probably used to. So what does pure and lazy mean? That's pretty much what I just said, actually. So each function produces results on its arguments. So if, if, if the function wishes to access files or the network or to print something, print something out, then it must, must denote that in the types of the function. So if we look at... Um, we're, we're going to be using a bit of this notation here. So basically these two columns here you can read as is of type. So you can read this as length is of type, a function from a list of anything, and returns an integer. And you'll notice there that it does not say integer IO. So if in this function you were to go off and read the read the file or read the network or, or whatever it is, you you won't um, you'll get a compile time error, or or you won't satisfy that type signature. So that's as opposed to this function here, which takes in a, a file path and it returns the file contents within I/O. So it denotes in the type signature there that that function there is going to go off to I/O. Okay, and um, that's the evaluation model that I just spoke about there, called by me. <coughs> so, on automated testing, which is what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, so, these are the, the manual ones here. Well, they're full of automated, but they're actually manual. So, um, they're clumsy and laborious. I'll show you why. Um, and then there's automated testing. Um, we're going to be using Quick Check for, for Haskell, um, Scala Check. Um, so I've done a little bit of work on Scala check, so that's the same thing but for Scala. Function of Java, um, that's the same thing but for Java, um, which, which is quite a mission. And FS check is the same thing again for F sharp. And um, I'll show you how to do correctness verification cleverly. <coughs> so on on uh, purity, so um, like I said, pure, purity and laziness are the two key key attributes of Haskell, or the, the thing that differentiates from the languages that a lot of other languages. So one thing is that it leads to composition and abstraction, and um, it has some far-reaching uh, implications. But I'm, I'm not going to. I'm sort of going to brush over those as we go through. But I um, I implore you to look into that a bit further because um, it does give you some key benefits in your software development. So I was just wondering if anyone can see a problem with that code there. Not not, not that it doesn't um, behave correctly, but I mean, would anyone would you write this kind of code? Anyone? No. I wouldn't. <coughs> no. Okay. See, I'd rather write that code there. All right. So that print line or the print yeah print line was repeated twice. So we basically, in that, that previous expression, we intertwined a side effect, the printing, with the pure expression, which was the, um, the uh, if logic. So what we've done here is we've moved the pure function, the, this <coughs> if expression here, and then wrapped it around with a side effect, which is the print line, which makes this thing here a reusable component. So I'm not doing the topic justice there, but I'm just giving you a sort of a, a, a touch on what it, what it means to aim for purity. So Haskell will, will make will help you achieve that that level of um, you know wrapping the I/O right at the outside to a to a greater extent than a lot of other languages will. Would it be useful to say why print line is pure? It, it's it's not pure because it um, so it uses I/O so it prints the standard out of the string. <coughs> so the, the type signature of this expression here is um is that which is a string. Whereas the type signature of print line it will be um, takes a string to I/O and then void. Um, I can verify that if you like. So if I was to say, uh, what is the type signature it's called print? So you can roughly read that as. I'm um, oh, sorry if you can't read that. Is that really hard to read? That's no, okay. Okay. So you can roughly read that as string to I/O void. 
Whereas if I was to write something like um, if true, then do, then I uh, the type of it. So yeah, it tells me it's a, it's a list of characters for a string. But it's saying no expression there is a type list of characters. So is IO a special type name that means does IO? Sorry? Is IO a special type name that means it does IO? Correct, yeah. Um, IO is actually called a type constructor. So yeah, it's it's a it's actually a primitive in Haskell, so the, the Haskell runtime or well, the Haskell compiler has to know about it and do special things with it. So <clears throat> basically if you see this if you see a function that has this type or an expression that has this type, you can guarantee that it's not going off to the network or the disk or, or anything like that. So that's the important part. Alright, so let's go. We're going to use quick check and um, you can cheat or you can type all that out. So I've put this in an appendix in that document. Okay, so um, if, if you do get stuck putting out, there's a few guys here that use Haskell a fair bit. Alright, so basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to override the default configuration for quick check and I'm going to say run 500 tests per what's called a property. <clears throat> so like I said, we're going to automate our tests. So I'm not going to write 500 tests by hand. Oh, and uh, that's a line comment, by the way, in Haskell, so don't have to suck. And uh, these are called modules. Save that in a, in a file and then go to a console that uh, into it, yeah, go to a console that has into the directory that has that file and start up GHCI, which is the, the uh, Haskell interpreter. And then I've well, got some instructions there. I don't think they're really Anyone getting errors? Okay. 
So, and then just type, type this expression here, and basically all I'm going to do is check that true is true 500 times, and it should still be true 500 times. And all we're doing here is running an automated test, but I'm not doing anything. And you should get, um, should get 500 tests passed with that configuration. And we've told it to run 500 tests for a maximum before we decide to be passed. All right. So let us, I've, I've started off simple here, so hopefully not too simple, but anyway. Suppose we write this function for multiplication, which we wouldn't normally write. But we want, to, we want to say something like, for all possible values of x and x times 1 equals x. All right, so in, in the typical J unit of um, those kind of, that kind of testing, you'd write something like, um, you know, assert, 3 times 1 equals 3, so 4 times 1 equals 4, but instead we're going to do, this is called universal quantification, so we're quantifying over x and we're saying for all x, then x times 1 equals x. <coughs> so you can define a function like that in your source file, you can call it whatever you want, as long as it's the same down there. And we're just saying, you can read it on the left hand side of the uh, equals, you can say for all x, then x times 1 equals x, and so we're defining a property there. <clears throat> yeah, put it into that same source file where you've got all the imports and that kind of thing. And then uh, in, if you type uh, colon reload into GFCI, or well, just colon R actually will do, that will reload your changes that you just put into your text file. And then you should, this one should be available then. And you should be able to run it. Okay, so as a notice, you can use type completion. You can see how it Yeah, move on, yeah. Unless you're running in a new map, which you can't. All right. Yeah, so there's tab completion in, in here in some certain environments. Um, in, the, in the interpreter. Sorry? That was just not quick as it went Yeah. I couldn't wait it longer. <laughs> um, and also, just to note here, when you're here at the interpreter, you can type colon T in <coughs> any expression to give you the type, just like I showed you before. So you could ask for the type of this expression here. Alright, and it'll probably say something like um, num A and then A to Boolean, I imagine. Yep. Yeah. And you can, you know, you can ask for the type of the, the check and of our config and then of the whole expression or parts of the expression and, and all that kind of thing. So we're not doing any IO here. We're just doing pure functions at the moment. And um, you just have to take my word for it for now is that this check function here put 500 values into X and then made sure that it was true when it came out the other side. Um, look, you don't have to fully take my word for it anyway, because I'll tell you why. So just, just to get the fundamentals down, let's do it again. <laughs> we're going we're to test the community property of addition. So we, I think we'll know a plus b equals b plus a for all a and b. So we're just going to write that in code. <clears throat> and we're going to check that again. Actually, we're going to do it. Sorry, that's a lot. Yeah, we can't do it. 
printing out of Viacom or classified as a test So this particular expression here we've repeated twice already now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a function that, um, that encapsulates that, um, to use uh, John Hughes terminology to be willing together of these two parts to create another part called our check. You'll notice we'll get yeah, an error if you're not going to type signature here. So that's a Haskell type signature. So basically, like I said, it's Haskell's typing third, and and you have the option of putting type signatures here. This is, this is how you write one of those type signatures. And this is saying that you can, you can almost think, um, I'll get in trouble with saying this, but you can almost think of this as an interface, and it's saying for anything that implements this interface, and it takes one of those, and then, then I.O. And I said before we weren't using I.O., and that was a lie. That's because um, we were printing out OK Pass 500 tests. I was doing a print. Put it in I.O. I didn't think of that. And the random number generation stuff would be I.O. as well. Um, that's, that's handled by a quick check in, you know. Yeah. In a way, uh, actually, I think they use I.O. for that. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I think they might work around it so that it doesn't appear in the type signature. Maybe they use the ST or something. Do yeah. you have uh, issues point three for the Yeah, I have. <laughs> probably don't understand what goes on. Yeah, so, okay. Well, I mean, you can almost think that we've repeated this, this expression here twice now. So every, everywhere that we use this expression, we can now replace it with this one. And, and that's a particular property of pure functional languages is that you can just take this and replace it with that. But one, one, Brad's just noted here that I've, um, I've, I've, done, I've used what's called partial application. So this function, this function here takes two arguments and uh, prints, so it's an I.O. result. Um, you can check that in your interpreter, so, you know, type, what's the type of check? And um, I've only applied one argument. And so what I've done here is I've, I've left that the second argument off, which you will have to apply to this expression here when you go to use it to get the I/O result. Does that make sense? So another way of writing that actually is by to write it out as you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, is you could write on. Um, you write our check x equals. Um, check our pointy x like that. Note that if you do that, then you don't need the type signature. That's true. Yes, I probably should have done that in that slide actually. So if you put that, you won't need that type signature either. Yeah. Okay. No confused faces yet. Yeah. Awesome. Oh yeah, and. Uh, <coughs> Let's just lay the point. Well, we can just look at this one if you like. I mean, um, at some point in time, I'm sure you've all come across the Morgan laws. Um, that is that for all P and Q, not P and Q, is equivalent to not P or not Q. And the second one there, which you can read. Um, so actually, yeah, so this particular function here, you can almost think of that as a loop. Um, where, I'm, where I'm doing a, a, like a side effect, an on IO action in each iteration of the loop. And um, this is the action to do on each iteration of the loop, and these are the arguments. So I'm saying each time you go around the loop, apply this function to that, then that, and it, it does exactly that, and it passes 500 tests. Um, even though for each of these properties, there are only uh, four possible combinations for the name of that function. So, you know, it can be true, 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 false, false, true, and false, false. So, there's 500 to go forward there. Looks like some people are typing that in, so I'll leave it. Are we done? Oh, yeah, mate. Type that into your source file. You can actually do it there. You have to use the right to the left. So instead, put that in your source file. Actually, put that in your source file. Let's check what that gives you. So just put an X there and then put that in when you need that type signature. That's the type signature. That's a function. It's not that much. I've made that same mistake 
that when I was writing these slides. So it was and, uh, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if we come across it again. And that's a function of the Oh yeah. So some of you guys probably aren't too familiar with Pascal syntax. So this is a back tick there, um, it appears on my keyboard only on the top left. And basically that's saying so I, I could have actually moved this function here to the left of this and said mapdam underscore out check and then the list, this is a list here. But um, I'm I'm a bit of a sucker for using it's, it's called using a function in the infix position. So I put the two arguments on either side of that function, and that's because it's it's um, alphanumeric. Um, so you know it starts with M. So I can use it in the infix position so long as I surround it in back ticks. Okay, so I'll, be, I'll just repeat that. I can get rid of those back ticks and move that function to the left. If I like. In, in fact, you can even ask for the type of that expression in your interpreter if you like. And so I think basic back ticks basically turn up. Name into an operator. Yeah, it's kind of like an operator. Yeah. So you know, like, so you know, it's not plus, but you can imagine like plus or you know, just something like that. But it's it's um it's alphanumeric, yeah, so it's, it's using the same position like plus would. And the opposite for operators brackets plus. Yeah. So if, if it was not alphanumeric, like for example, so when when we write in ASP, we write two plus two. We're saying apply this argument and that argument to plus. But we could equally write plus two two. Alternatively, if this function here was called say add, we could write add two two, or we could write two back tick add two. And that's because add is alphanumeric. Okay, so I've, I've sort of gone with this option here. I could have written it that way, map in our check in that list, but instead I wrote it this way. So these sort of things slip my mind that it's going to matter. But, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. So does that only work for two group of functions, or what? Um, it, it only does for two the L first two values in the function. Then you have to go and apply that as a prefix function to the next value. So yeah. that's how they define the dot for function opposition. Oh right, yeah. Well, I mean. The, the, that question actually opens the can of worms is of Haskell functions only take one argument mm -hmm. kind of thing. So to, to answer that question fully, um, it will take a lot of time. <laughs> but that will be another talk. <laughs> so if you didn't put that back ticks, would that map in be a variable? Uh, if I didn't put those back ticks, what would happen then? Um, yeah. is it, it would try to apply this function, uh, this this function here to that argument, and it wouldn't type check. So you can come up with a type error. All right, so if we get it wrong, and you guys can try, you can comment this out after you've written it or something like that, but if we check your subtraction commutes, which we all know it doesn't, um, and we try and check that, we get a failed test. And that's telling us um, what arguments it used to uh, to falsify that particular property. Tony, I don't like duplication, it's sick, it's like in colon, huh? 
Um, you can use the up arrow. You can write a script to sit there and, and hold an R every three seconds. Have a sip on your drink. And you come back with a little But it's good that you don't like typing for a lot. I don't think it's I mean, there's, there's development environments being written that hopefully will take away some of that flavour. <coughs> so, yeah, we notice here that we've got a, a counterexample that said that when A equals 1 and B equals negative 2, the property doesn't hold. So, one, one other particular attribute of this type of testing is you get what's called shrinking. Um, so, for example, I could put in, say, 100 and 300 and the property still wouldn't hold, but you'll notice here that it didn't report that counterexample, it reported a, um, a smaller counterexample. Okay, so, Basically, if you're writing a code and you go, I, I believe this property holds, you'll come up with this counterexample, which is hopefully shrunk down to some, some level. And then you can go, well, somewhere something doesn't fit in terms of my, um, my mental model of the problem that I'm solving because I thought this was true, but it's not. Here's the counterexample to that. All right, so I just thought we'd write, we'd have a look at the take function. So there's, there's a heap of list functions in Haskell. Um, so we'll have a look at the take function, and basically take, take is a type integer to list of anything and return to list of that anything. So here's some experiments that I just invented here that you might want to try out. So if you did say take three on the empty list, um, you should get back the empty list. Um, just, to, just to prove my point, just ask for the type of take. You can even ask for the type of take three, and you'll notice that that, that argument has been applied, and there's just one more argument to go before it gets a list. Pretty shiny talk there. Can everyone read that? I'll, I'll, I'll type it myself. So, take three, zero to nine. So if I did take 3 from 0 to 9, I get back a list 0, 1, 2. And if I did uh, take 5 from 0, 2, 4, 6, I should get back that same list 0, 2, 4, 6. So basically it takes that many elements from the list, um, unless there's not that many elements, in which case it just returns the list itself. Um, and just to just to uh, go on that back tick point, we can use take in the position. So if we go, um, zero to one So that'll return the first seven from zero to one We try and write a property and we say that for any list, a string is a list, it's a list of characters. So for any list, then taking five from that list and then getting a length equals five. And that's not actually true because it's not true for lists that have a length of less than five. Does that make sense? So if I, if I said, um, if I pass in, say, just an empty list and I said take five from the empty list, that becomes the empty list. Just take five from the empty list, and the length of that is zero. Zero equals five is false, so that property won't hold. In fact, the told you didn't hold the empty list there, so it falsified that particular property. Does that make sense? Oh, sorry for string, but your character. Oh, crap. 
Um, change that string, sorry. Um, change that. that Looks a fine to show. That's all good. Actually, <laughs> no, 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 no. Sure, but you can probably do that type signature. Yeah. Yeah. Work for any list. Yeah. Or if you want, yeah, it works yeah. without the. If you change string to that, then uh, then that'll work as well. So if you get rid of that type signature, we'll change string to that. It's falsified the next list too. Yeah. Then it will falsify instead of. See, I oh, yeah, I don't know that. Sorry. That we do write an arbitrary chart. It's just that we haven't yet. It'll, it'll print out that or well, something like that. Anyway, it yeah. might not. Yeah, uh, it does. You can, you know, pardon? It uses a unified fault if you don't have a type signature. Oh, it does too. Yeah, that's actually why I put type signature there. It's yeah. Although it doesn't matter in this case. Yeah. yeah See, so the old version of QuickCheck didn't use the do that. It's either less than or equal to 5, and then the test should pass. So if you change that equals to less than or equal to 5, then you're going to test for right. Any other letter, I just chose to use the prime character, you know, the single quote. It's normally used as some function or as to specify a different version of a function and whatever as well. Yeah, which is that. So it, it basically, you, the, the previous um, function that you had in there is not going to clash with the name of this function because, you know, this is just a whole different identifier. So you can have both in there. And this is, I sort of use this mentally because it just means a new version of the, of the previous function. This one's fixed and the other one's broken. So it's nothing special, even though you know it's not a letter, but you can just treat it as if it's a letter as part of an identifier. So it's quite amusing in that school. I was the other day where somebody used it as like an apostrophe and an identifier tone or something or whatever. <laughs> oh yeah. I saw some of that too. How did you fix that? Yeah, get the pieces. Yeah, so you should be able to write something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, probably even so just to don't probably even use the to don't something like that anyway. Yeah. You get pretty silly. There's a keyword in asset. Which we'll see actually. Alright. So sometimes we don't want to test so when we were generating um, what's called arbitrary values for the, for the input of the function, like we were just generating, we had a list of images, sometimes we put in the empty list, sometimes we put in a list with just zero in it, sometimes we put in big lists or whatever. Sometimes we want to restrict which what values we want to put in. So for example, if you were testing the function that gets the first element of a list, um, it's called head, you don't want to quantify it over the empty list because if you put head on the empty list, you'll get an explosion. Or an exception, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that was satisfying. Yeah, I call it an explanation. I don't like We have to leave them just. So, basically, you want, you want to say something like if, if you were testing the head function, you'd say something like um, if the list contains at least one element, then this implies that your property. Does that make sense? So, you can. You can almost think of it as an if-then statement. So if the list is empty, then, then, you, then you'd state your property. You'd say something about the head function. All right, so a good example, is it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, convoluted, but it's, it's, it's um, testing for division or integer division. So if we, if we could say that, so this div and mod function here, again, are like um, integer division in um, C-like languages. So if we did something like, a divided by B and then multiplied by B and then added on the remainder, we should get back to A. I think everyone agrees with that. So if we did something like um, 43 divided by 7, <coughs> then we should get back to 43. 
which will give us uh, six, and then the remainder will be one. So if we did six times seven plus one, we should get back to that 43. However, if we, if we wrote this properly, and you should write that and try and run, run, a, run the test, you'll get an exception. Um, because B, it will try and run B as zero. And of course, when you do A divided by zero, whatever A there is, um, you're going to get, get one of these, an explosion. So that's a good example of when you would use implication. Okay, so has everyone typed that? Yep. So you would write instead, when B is not equal to zero, that's not equal B by the way, it's not an exclamation mark like you might be used to. When B is not equal to zero, then this implies that. Okay, so basically it's never going to put in um, a value for B equals zero into this expression here. So we'll get it, we'll get all our testing to pass. So actually this is a good example of um, of an infix operator, so I've like had two plus two. So this particular function here is acting on that argument there and then that argument there. So you could actually use brackets and stuff if you want to be a bit silly there. Now, if you had <coughs> notice also that this expression here won't evaluate the one on the right hand side. So this isn't a good case, but there are cases where you know you might actually call head on the on the list. Let's suppose we're testing head. If you call if you said something like when the list is not empty, then call head on that list. In languages that are strict, like C like languages, that, that head function call to an empty list would still happen. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that good enough? Whereas Haskell's a lazy language, so that won't happen. That makes sense, no? Yes. So if you said something like <coughs> um, not empty list, let's just imagine we were using some other language we wrote implies, then you went um, and actually that passing the list there, then list.head, well, we we asked for the first element of that. We said so when the list is not empty, then this implies that and then we did something with the property. Of, uh, this list.head function would still be called. So this whole expression would explode. Does that make sense? Even though, we've, so we'd have to do, I mean, if you're using, say, Java or C Sharp or something, you'd have to write an interface that returns a value on one of its methods, and then you'd have to write an instance of that or a delegate if you're using C Sharp. You'd have to um, basically have that, have that expression there evaluate later. And then this implies method would have to then call on that. Does that help me? So this that particular problem does not exist in a lazy language like Haskell. So there's particular properties about lazy languages, and that's one of them. Okay, so let's do some test driven development. It's going to get hard now. So okay. So do you want to stop this much? Yeah, is everyone all good? Hassle <laughs> not. Yeah, I mean, me, or there's a couple other guys around, and I don't, I don't, I can usually tell when someone's really lost. I don't think there's any of those. <coughs> Sometimes people yeah. are the master of those. <coughs> so, basically, we're going to define this function called f, and it takes a list of anything and returns a list of anything. And this is a special function here in Haskell, and that means blah blah. So, we're not, well, I'm not writing a body here. And I'm going to write a property. So basically, if you were to do it, you know, type out check property one, you should get an exception because it's going to call f and f is going to blow up. So the idea here is to make this property pass. By, un by getting rid of that and doing something else. So you will have to be a bit familiar with Haskell syntax in order to do that. If you're not, look at the guy next to you. If he's not asking, look at the guy next to him, and so on. That's a very nice solution, isn't it? <laughs> 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 
we would have to give yeah. a number of people in the year. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so in order to get that, I mean, just off the top of my head, you should be able to change this line here to, um, to say F on the empty list equals the empty list. I'm pretty sure that that will make that property pass. And this is a particularly mundane property, or it's actually quite convoluted. Actually, because we're not quantifying on anything. We're just saying that this is true for that value. It's like a it's like a J unit test, effectively. We're just saying that the cert f on the empty list gives us the empty list. And so, if you change that line there to that, that property there should, should pass. I mean, to that string experience. Yeah, I should. So. This is an empty string here, so these double quotes. And this is just so this is an empty list of characters. That's an empty list of anything. So they're they're effectively equivalent. It's just that this is special syntax. So you know if you, if you did that in your interpreter, you get back true. A characters numbers. Sorry. A characters number. No, characters are of type char. So you, you could do this if you what's the type of that and it should stay char. And you won't want to talk about pattern matching. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So we're actually pattern matching here, so let's suppose this was changed to this. Basically when the runtime comes into, when, when a list is passed into this function f, it'll run from top to bottom trying to match it. Yeah, so it gets pretty very If it hits the empty list, it's going to return that value there. And in this case, for any other case, it's going to give you an exception. <coughs> an exception. For this demonstration, you could call, you could call it FA equals the empty list. That's true. Yeah. Actually, you could call, you could write mm -hmm. F underscore if the empty list. So this underscore says catch everything and return the empty list. That would be necessary in this test a little more to work on. Well, it won't because we're not quantifying on it. Just doing that. So does the try those in source file order? Yep. So from top to bottom. So just, just um, I mean, generally you try and try and not overlap your patterns. So um, you know, if you ever do want to look into pattern matching um, in languages like Haskell, because there's other languages that have pattern matching, um, BML languages and Scala and all that. Um, you generally try not to overlap your patterns as much as you can, which means you should be able to switch their order without affecting the program happening. Okay, so that should get that property passing. So let's get this one going. <coughs> so basically that's saying for any, for any value, and if I put that value into a list and then apply F to it, I should get back just the same list. And once again, you can just do this. It's a bit too funny. You won't always just be able to do this, not the next one. Either. And if, if you can, um, that this is called a non-exhaustive pattern. So, like I said before, if it comes through here and it's not a, it's not an empty list and it's not a list with one element, but it's another list, then it's going to give you a runtime exception. So we could use um, exhaustive pattern matching by saying, well, F on anything else as it ever fall through, or then just, you know, return the empty list. Does that make sense? Although, if you leave that line out, um, it, should never, it should never hit this with that property anyway. So if you've got this in your source file now, so this is just the next line, by the way, in, the, in that source file. And you try and run that property, you should get 500 test passing. Plus plus is 
concatenate two of these together. Yep. So basically, that's saying for any for any two lists x and y, if I concatenate x and y and then apply f, I'll get back the same thing as if I applied f to y, concatenate the result to f applied to x. So let's just run through an example. If, if x was say a, b, c, and y was uh, b, e, f, then f, a, b, c, uh, a, b, c, d, e, f, is the same thing as, um, oh, wait a minute, it's a uh, huge So just a, b, c, d, e, f is the same thing as f, d, e, f, concatenated to f, a, b, c. So we have to make this property hold somehow. Has anyone got that property to hold? How did you do it? Let's put f of x equals x. Put a third. Oh. You need to reverse it then. That's the function for that. Yeah, you can just do it. Maybe I'll type the property too wrong. Oh, you, have you got property 3 passing? Yeah, it doesn't work either. Uh, have you? I don't, I don't think you can. you make pass? Pass is with some. And say you part your. Uh, yeah. Hang on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Works on mine too. I don't think you need the first, though, you just need that in the past. Well, that doesn't work for me. Check your property three whether you've got the right order for property three because. And take off y plus plus f of x. Yeah, it doesn't look like it should work. Yeah, mine works. It doesn't look like it should, but it does. We've got all the tricks. Alright. It'll only work if you delete the other two functions first. If you delete the first two patterns. Then you can get it to work with the third one on its own. But you have to yeah. delete the first two. That first. still couldn't work either. No, I've got all three of them. I've got all three of them. It's not working here. Can you run it multiple times? Can you run the test multiple times and it still works? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well. They're my favourite test. You guys can go home now. I'll have to figure that one out. Okay, you're reversing everything, so. Yeah, um, yeah, the ghost for now. There's a ghost. <laughs> Alright, anyway. So, if you're um, if, uh, in the Mac build with GFC, does this need to be in the server? Maybe it's a version. What version are you on? Yeah, maybe uh, that's what I'm doing. I wouldn't expect that. It's a pretty serious bug. 6101. I've got 6103. I've got 6103. 623. 8. 3. All oh, right. Yeah. So I'm using six point ten point two. I don't think it should matter though, because yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah. I'm one. Quick yeah, check. One point one. That's a puzzle for you guys. That's all part of the manual. So you don't expect that. <laughs> you don't expect that to pass. Well, it's not passing for me. So for some people, and if you look at what the actual thing does, I can't imagine it to pass. Yeah, it's 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 pass. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, because you're saying you're, saying you're reversing the list and you start with. So unless you have revert, if you're, unless you're reversing the list, because you're keeping the order of the list and then concatenating when on the right hand side from the property, identity shouldn't work. No, it shouldn't. Identity shouldn't unless work. quick check somehow on generates singleton lists. Well or empty lists. 
Maybe then, maybe it'll help you once you That's what I'm thinking. So I, even if you didn't have that type signature, it would still be using unit values. Oh, unit values, that's what, yeah. Does that have, do you have type signatures on your property? I'm, I'm, well, j just to double check, can I change that to um, change A to int and oh, yeah, A to You have to fix your property one, change property one then. Oh, yeah, you will. So change but that. I'm, I'm for your property two, three, do you have a type signature? Um, no, that's why it's using that. That would be too, yeah. And units are still so more actually knew that, that's why I did that anyway. Yeah, there we go. That's that was on my notes. Yeah, so if you, I'm pretty sure if you put in a uh, type signature for property 3 like that, then you'll get a failure. And I was trying to hope to sort of skim over that particular issue. It's come up a couple of times now. Um, so basically, the the values we're quantifying over have to be, um, or they, you should try to be in certain cases like the one that we just experienced, monomorphic. So there's no type parameters here. This is just a list of integers. There's no type variables. That we're not saying list of many things or anything like that. And this is another reason why, despite Haskell being type invariant, you generally go and do types anyway. Yeah. Well, there's a couple of reasons. Yeah. So that's one of them. It does. It fails with the types initial. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, so that's why I was parking here, I was using this file. Yeah, this case Okay. All right. So, the, what, the reason I did all of this anyway is that if you, if we had to hit that little problem and you all had had um, passing tests, you were guaranteed to have the reverse function. So, that's basically we. Um, Yeah, so if, if your test always passed, then you're guaranteed to be reversing the list that was given and you had type signatures and all that kind of thing. So there's a particular um, particular property about that is that we have documentation for the code. So we've got the type signature, we've got those three properties. There's nothing more we can say about that function. Tony, did you want to do the correct answer? Yeah, F equals reverse. F of X equals reverse answer. All that F equals for us. Yep. Um, so actually, I mean, I'll, I'll do that if I like. So, yeah, please. Yeah, so. That, that there will get the property in class. So just F equals reverse. That, that's just a library function question. So you can write it out with longhand or. Um, this is how some people write reverse. Um, it's not a particularly. I think you need a singleton one as well. Yeah, anyway, I'm not going to do it. So what's the full version? So what, why is f of x equals reverse x the same as that term? Because of partial application. All right, so if we go to, um, if we ask for the type of reverse, it says it takes a list, a list of anything and returns a list of anything. And if we said um, the type of reverse on the end of the list is just a list of anything. <clears throat> so basically F had this type signature as well. So I could have said something like, um, because I'm in GF, so I have to use the let keyword. So I could say something like let F X equals reverse X. <clears throat> so basically that's saying here's the function F. It has a um, name its argument X and apply reverse to that argument. So if I did that, and then um, I asked for the type of the f, it'll give me the same type as reverse. Alternatively, I could just leave off the x, and I could say that. So I don't give it an argument with which to apply reverse to. Does that make sense? And so g will also have that same type signature. And this becomes really handy because you can compose your functions and whatever as well. Yeah, it, it's very, very useful. Um, if you if you have Martin Fowler's refactoring book, there's one called replace parameter with method. So this is this is um, doing it properly. So you know writing functions that take two arguments and then go and write another function that takes only one argument that applies the other argument. Whereas this just you don't have to fuss around with that. So yeah. Can you explain a bit about why it was uh, seemed to be working for people? Yeah, um, 
the default the default value in Haskell is unit, which is just open bracket, yeah. close bracket, and it's that's the it's like void in yeah. Java and whatever, and it's the only value in that type. Yeah. And so when you so it would create a list full of those, and because they're all equal to each other, the order doesn't matter. Whereas if you use anything like integers, the order does matter because they're not all equal to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to say it another way, the unit type is. Um, has only one value, and if you had a list of, if, you had, if we had, say, a list of length five that had just that one value in it, then another list of length three that had just that one value in it, and then concatenated it, the five to the three, and then did three to the five, we'll get back the same list. That's a problem, but if we had just arbitrary integers in there, like in you know, one, two, three, then we wouldn't get, we wouldn't uh, get our test passing. So, Oh, Tony, what is it that makes it default to unit? Oh, that's just part of the picture. It's just, oh, it's okay. the simplest one. Yeah, it's the simplest type. Oh, okay. It's, it's called the once inhabited type. It's just the, the type with only one value. It's a bit of a nightmare, though, isn't it? Having a passing test and it should be filed. Mm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's nothing we can do about that. I mean, well, actually, old versions of QuickCheck would give you a compile time error for that. And, um, they must have put the unit value in afterwards. Yeah, they did. And some say, I mean, I only know that because I just noticed one day that I ran into the problem that we just ran into again. So, do you, like, when you're coding, do you, do you put the types of functions? Is that like a rule you apply to your developing? That you Generally, I do, yeah. When do you choose? Um, put them in when not? I, well, if I'm writing tests, I, I do. I'm just because I'm up here talking, I completely forgot about that. No, that's all right. But um, and <coughs> if I don't export the function, I sometimes I don't. And if the function, so you can actually have functions whose scope is only to, to within a function. Yep. And so in those cases, in, I don't. And in some cases, you actually can't. Um, in, in those particular cases. Generally, also that you, if you are exporting the function, you will put in the type definition. Because otherwise the documentation doesn't get generated when using yeah. Haddock. Okay. Yeah, so Haddock is like Java doc um, or N doc, and so if you don't have a type signature in there, um, Haddock won't won't um, generate the documentation for that particular function. Yep. All right. So we have um, unambiguous specification for the reverse function. Um, although we don't have a proven, we've just had a fail to falsify our particular properties. Um, Do you want to talk about that briefly, Tony? Because that was an important distinction I found with, with this stuff, what the difference is between a proof and yeah. falsification. All right. Um, well, yeah, we could talk about that for a very long time, actually. Yeah, I think we should probably move on. All right, so we'll move on very quickly here, is this particular function, this is a function signature here, and again I haven't defined it, I'll just give you straight what the answer is. Basically I'm passing in two functions, it's just a function from anything A to anything B, and a function from anything B to anything C, and returns back a function from anything A to anything C. Alright, so, if we just if we just start to map this out in our head, we'll call this one here F, and we'll call that one G. Okay, so, we, we take this A in the function that we're returning, we plop, plop it into F, we'll get back a B, get that B, put it into G, get back a C, and return it. A few days, it looks there. Okay, so the, the particular reason I'm giving you this function signature here is that if, if I, you know, if, if you were familiar with the Haskell syntax and you came back to me and said, I have a fun, I have, I've written this, and um, it satisfies the type signature, and it, it terminates. You have to give me that guarantee as well. Um, on a win. And then you would be guaranteed to give me a particular function. It's called function composition, actually. So we're composing these two functions here. So returning that particular function there, and we're composing the two given functions. So. Um, there it is right there. So see, actually I'll, I'll write that out long hand. So if I said S F H G equals Alright. So I've just rewritten 
there is H. So I've just written, rewritten it there as H. So I've named that function there F, that function there G, then I've returned a function, I've given an A, puts A into F, and that expression there is in type B, and then applies G to B, just to return C, and then that values the whole function value. Okay? So you'd be guaranteed to give me that function. So in other words, because I gave you the type signature from that, we can apply the, uh, the implementation with some quirks, with some, uh, not quirks, more so, I, I just told you to like Then, so if you guarantee, if, you, if that implementation terminates and doesn't throw exception, we've all got the same function, because we're just composing those two, and it's impossible to write tests for that function, there's nothing to write. So it's implied from the type signature. There's nothing to write there. So the particular lesson there is to aim for static guarantees for your type system. <coughs> and seek to automate testing as a second one. We do the manual testing under exceptional circumstances, and they're usually um, when we're doing I.O. And we use weak typing under even more exceptional circumstances. And I can say something rude there that I want. Alright, and so if you've ever used test driven development, you would have heard of mocking. So when mocking is effectively generating functions, so you can think of an object or an interface as a collection of functions. And so basically if we quantify over a function, we're, we're effectively doing what mocking does. So we can, I'll have to rush through the hard stuff, but anyway, we can, uh, there's a function called map in the uh, standard library, and it takes in a function from anything to B and a list of that anything and returns an anything of that B. So it basically runs through the list and applies this function to each element and returns the list. And there's a particular property that holds about map, and that is if we have any two functions, F and G, and then map, that's a bit of math for that. Map with a function that applies G and F to each element, and that's the same as just mapping the G and then mapping the F. No, didn't work, did it? What it's saying is that it's useless to go on call map twice, one after the other, with two different functions. Yeah. You can go and just do with one with the functions combined. So if I if I had a, if I said map, let's say we're going to go across a list of integers. For each integer, we'll call it X. And we're going to go um, uh, x plus 1 times 2. That's so x plus 2. Pardon? That's just x plus 2. Yeah. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make it simple, but yeah. If we did square in that one. Oh, yeah. Just for any, for all, uh, for all F and G, back here, across any list, if it was there. And that's equivalent to going map um, G on Z, and then going map F on the result of that. Does that help? So just think of map as just running a function across a list and, and producing another list out the each side for each element in that list. So we're saying if we get these two functions f and g, we apply g then f, and that's the same as applying g across the list and then f across the list. So we're, we're effectively quantifying over functions and, and lists actually, and the list. So that's pretty much what I just wrote there. Does that make sense? That this is equivalent to that. Yeah, yeah you could write that in quick check. But in fact, so it, that's that's really important because in a functional language you can you can actually do um, expression substitution. Alright, so this particular expression here is exactly equivalent to this one on the right here. So you can just eliminate that or report immediately. And in fact the only difference is that between between that and that. And you're most free to go and write for all f and g, say so write for all f and g, then uh, and x, um, f g x is equivalent to 
f dot gx. This stuff actually happened automatically now in the late newer versions of the Haskell compiler. It'll actually go and say if you've gone and done map twice, you'll go and fuse them together. Yeah. So that's particular compiler optimization. So running through the rather than running through the list twice if you do two maps, it'll know that it can actually run through the list once and do this. Anyway. I'm happy to answer that question on, on the list if it comes up. If we want to talk about that one further. Right, so probably won't have time to get too much further. But um, suppose if, if we had, say, this is this is just a standard data type in Haskell, so it's just um, so it's just a person with an age type integer, first name type string, sound type string, and gender type char. Um, just a bit difficult. So if we want to quantify across a person, um, we would have to um, write our own arbitrary instance, which is a, a library, it's called a type class, it's part of the object library. <laughs> so, if we were to write this function, say, that took a list of persons and summed up their age and returned the result, that's how it looks. Um, actually, we could probably talk about that particular. But, um, so, age is a function that takes a person and returns an integer, returns the age of the person. So, we're saying, um, map that function age across this list of persons, which will get us back a list of integers, which will be all their ages, and then sum the result, that list of integers down to an integer. So if we were to write a property, say, like that, and we said that, um, we said that for any list of persons, then if we take the sum of their ages, as we apply sum of ages, and then subtracting them all back off, we should get back to zero. And if we were to try and run that, we'd get that compile time error message. And that's saying there's no arbitrary per person, so you need to define an arbitrary type class. I mean, it's kind of like saying, um, you can almost think of it that, um, like this as an interface, and it's saying the person class doesn't implement the arbitrary interface, except the real word for this is called a type class. So, <clears throat> We could write an arbitrary person. Oh yeah. So, uh, um, because arbitrary is an interface, you can almost think of it as um, if you're used to these kind of languages where you write interface arbitrary a, and it's just got a method that returns a gem um, called arbitrary. <coughs> so, gem is effectively equivalent to arbitrary. So there's these two particular functions here. Um, this one's pronounced bind, and it takes a, a gen of anything, and then a function from that anything to a gen of, again, another anything b, and then returns a gen of b, and return takes a value and puts it inside a gen. So using these two functions here, we could take the arbitrary for Boolean. Sorry, don't double book. All right, mate. Thanks. No worries. Um, we could take the arbitrary for Boolean, Okay, and then we could call this function bind, and then if that boolean there is true, then we use f, and if it's false, we use n. So then we've got a gen for the character. Does anyone, does that make sense? I'm hoping that makes sense, because I'd like to talk about this more some other day. So we, we basically use an existing arbitrary for boolean, which is part of the QuickTech library. And using that boolean, we've, we've created a gen char using these two functions here, bind and return. And return is not a keyword, by the way. It's just a function. So <coughs> let's just think of that as a gen boolean and a gen bool. And then we'll, we've passed in, we have to pass in a function from boolean to gen char, and then we'll get back a gen char. And so that's all in there is B. And by calling return on, so this whole expression here is, is a type char. And if you call return, we'll get back a gen char. So that's what we're returning there. And then the whole thing is a gen char. Does that help me? 
And in fact, we can do it with uh, with all the other ones as well. So we can we can use the arbitrary for integer um, string string one that we just wrote. And then we can do this. Create a person, and now we have an arbitrary for person. So in this instance here, that word there is a keyword. That there is a keyword, and uh, that's it. So the rest are all functions. So we're basically binding, so we're taking the arbitrary for boolean and then bind and then this is its whole argument right here. So it's taking an arbitrary boolean to a return a gen. This particular function here has to return a gen. This expression here has to return a gen for person, but it has sub-expressions and that is this one here, which is an arbitrary for string. We name that f. String again, so that's age, first name, surname. And finally we've constructed a person and then called return. And then we have a gen for person. So the key point there is we took the smaller parts to create a bigger part. So if you need to create an arbitrary for your, for your data type, you, you could probably use a library arbitrary for doing so. Um, and even more so, there's even special language syntax for this particular pattern of programming. Um, it's called do notation. So do is a keyword, and so is this left arrow here. So it's starting to look a bit like um, like uh, imperative code this. So we're basically saying, you know, sequence through these particular commands here and then return that particular value there. So I don't expect you all to get your head around that tonight, but I hope you will sometime. So I want to talk about it some more. Put it another yeah. way, way test you know this. Go back to the person data type here. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> what what we're doing is we've got a way of <coughs> we've got a way of generating arbitrary integers and arbitrary strings and arbitrary characters. We want to be able to generate a, an arbitrary person for our tests. Might not be a sensible person, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it might be a thousand years old or something. Maybe it's three. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So it's a way of com combining arbitraries that we already have and generating new arbitraries from that. That's what. Yeah. Um, using that bind in the term with <coughs> So, this particular pattern, does it have a name? And the answer is yes, it's called a monad. And have you seen this before? And the answer is almost certainly yes, just in different guises. And I told a lie. By the way, the signature for this function here is not gen, it's it's for anything, and for any type constructor, m. So there is one bit missing and they should specify that m is a monad other Yeah, one. so that's even more of a lie, isn't it? <laughs> 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 for any monad m, then m, yeah. So, um, if you use languages like Java or C Sharp, um, you won't be able to actually express this in the type system, because you'll need to to be able to um, abstract on a type constructor here. So just, you know, like, this could be actually a list. You could say a list of A, and then you come from A to list of B, and return a list of B. And it's the list part that, you, that we're abstracting on here. So it could be a list, or in our case, it could be a gen. Or in fact, there's a lot of things it can be. And IO is another one. So just, just to uh, divert things a little bit, Java has this particular pattern called the semicolon. If you use the semicolon, you use the monad. So basically, you're sequencing an effect. You've got a value, and then all the lines after that have access to that value within an, an affecting environment, and you keep it affecting. So doing side effect. And if you use the throws keyword in Java, you also use the monad. So you can see here I've, I've replaced n with particular values here. And so basically, so when you use the throws keyword, you're you're saying um, evaluate this particular expression, but if if you get a failure, if you get, a, if, um, if you get an exception as you do um, as you go through that function, then sequence it up until the first handler. So the, the only reason I wanted to point that out to you is because this particular pattern or shape of a problem is very familiar, and I, I hope to make that clear someday. I know it's not right now. Yeah, so I'll put that there just to show you that this signature here matches that, except I've replaced N with something. 
So if, we, if you've got a function that says it returns a value and it throws an exception, it actually returns either the value or throws an exception. It's actually returning one or two values, the exception or that value, and keeps going through. But that's for another day. Thanks. Thank Have I got any questions? Thank you, Friday, for on time. So, I mean, I should point out that some of what I spoke about today was probably a bit mundane and maybe a bit um, over the top, but, um, but I, I intended that. I like planting seeds rather than sort of dragging people on. Um, if, if you go off and learn some of this stuff on your own initiative, I'm happy to answer questions and I'm sure some of the other guys here are. But um, I think you will learn a lot if you were to do so. Um, I think we could probably have some personal testimonies to that effect as well. Um, that, that's why it was, you know, made you a bit um, laborious what I was, what I was doing on. But thanks anyway. Questions? Just a question about tests and tests. What was my question? <laughs> between proofs and tests. Oh, uh, false reaction. Yeah. Well, you're not checking every single possible set of lists in there to, ch to prove that, yes, you are actually really matching the behaviour. We're just creating a representative sample and testing on that. Yeah. Which is what QuickCheck basically does. A whole bunch of representative samples. Yeah, so you, you, I mean, you, you couldn't in fact exhaust that function because the number of this sample this is infinite. Yeah, all what I actually said was that you, you can claim that, that those, those three properties so you need to specify the reverse function. Yeah. There's no way to prove that though. Um, yeah, that's just, you'll have to believe me. Like, oh, I don't have a proof for that. And, and so, in fact, if, I mean, if you, for some particular functions, you can sit down and actually prove them. Um, you can probably use Haskell for that. Oh, um, I don't actually know the answer to that question, but I don't actually know the answer to that one. But yeah. I, I don't know the answer to the question for the next one about the, the type of those functions. Well, you, right. there are tools that can generate functions given a particular time. Yeah. Um, so that would show that you can generate, you can indeed generate a function. Whether you can prove that it's a unique function, I, can, I definitely can't think of a different one. You, oh yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, you'll just have to take my word for it again. So yeah, I'm not I, think, I, think, I think the question was, well, so the one question was, is, is there a, a difference between a proof? Like, is it a proof or is it a statement? Yeah, it, it's more like... Um, I mean, Matthew so knows what a proof is because he's writing stuff in code. So. Yeah, so we're not writing proofs here at all. In, in fact, we're conceding to the fact that we can't write proofs for the program. So we're just going to the next best thing, which is attempting to falsify using, in this case, randomly generated data applied to a function. Can you a way function? Yeah, I mean, you could do that in, in code. There's, um, <laughs> there's a paper, uh, Waddler's um, Theorems for Free. Yeah, the Free Theorems for that one yeah. is actually a lot more weaker than that. It doesn't just oh, okay. tell you this one. Well, I'm wrong. You could do, do a proof by parametricity, sure possibly. I'm not sure. <coughs>